Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've been doing this morning. What a great service so far. Um, earlier this summer, actually, it was kind of in, in the spring. Sorry, I may go to the handheld. We'll see. This stays put. Um, spending a lot of time with God and asking God for a new vision. And it seems to be kind of a theme this summer of revival, new vision, moving forward. God wants to do something in this house. And it's just been the theme of the summer. I've been hearing lots of people talking about that. And so I was asking God, you know, how do you get a vision? A lot of people are like, yeah, I know, I'm supposed to have a vision, I'm supposed to work that vision. And, you know, there's a verse that says, without a vision, the people perish. David mentioned it on Wednesday night. And I was thinking about that. Okay, so we need to have a vision or we will perish. Now, I don't think it means perish like you're going to die, but there are other forms of perishing. <coughs> Wilting, withering up, being ineffective, kind of spiritually dead ineffective. So I was thinking, okay, well, how do you get a vision? Believe it or not, everyone has a vision. Everyone. Okay. Baby Evelyn, our newest member of the congregation, she has a vision. Do you know what her vision is? To eat. <laughs> to be comfortable. To be loved. To be warm. She's got a vision. Does she do anything to help fulfill her vision? She cries. She does something, right? She doesn't just lay in a bed and do literally nothing. Even a baby has a vision and does something to see that vision fulfilled. So you all have a vision. Now some of you might be thinking, um, okay, what is it? <laughs> you may not know what that vision is. Well, think about how you spend your time when you have nothing to do. If you're driving to work, if you're waiting in a doctor's office, what do you spend your thoughts on? Where do you spend your thought life energy? That's your vision. Some of you have a vision that might be a little self-centered. My vision is about my to-do list today. My vision is about, oh, I can't wait until this is done so I can go home and just relax. Those are visions. Some people have those visions. Some people have visions that they feel like God has given them. But everybody has some kind of vision. The question is, what is your vision? What are you spending your thought life on? Because you have one and you do things to fulfill that vision, whatever it is. So, where does your vision originate from? Different sources, right? Sometimes I come up with my own vision, doing my own thing. A lot of that in the world. I want a new car, I'm gonna work for a new car, it's all about the new car. They've got a vision for a new car, or more money in a bigger house. And that is what they spend their whole thought life on. That's their vision, and they work for it, and they do things to accomplish that vision. They have a vision. So what is your vision? Some visions are long-term. Some visions are short-term. I have a vision of getting groceries today so that we can eat this week. <laughs> That's a short-term vision, right? I also have long-term visions for my family for what I want to see in uh, my school with my students and through my colleagues. Those are long-term visions. What kinds of vision do you have? Where do you spend your thought life? Okay, so let's go back a little bit. Y'all know, most of you know kind of our story of you know our family and building a stable, strong family. And that was my vision when my kids were little. And I thought, we were pretty successful in that vision. We've got some good kids. 
How did that vision become so strong in our family? Because that's the key, right? Knowing what your vision is and having it be strong enough to want to work for it to attain that vision. And I thought, well, my vision for my family came from my childhood. And it was actually based out of a need that went unmet in my childhood. I was an only child. I grew up in the country. Both my parents worked. I grew up alone, like for real, alone. Okay, there were two boys in my neighborhood. One was a couple years older, one was a couple years younger. That was it. So I spent a lot of time by myself. And I didn't want that for my family. So I wanted four to six kids. That didn't happen, but. But the point was, I wanted to not just have one kid because I didn't want my one kid to grow up like I did. So I had a vision of having multiple kids. And not only that, but when I was a kid, I was picked on. I was the quiet, shy, smart kid. And so I was picked on. And so I also had this vision of, man, wouldn't it have been great if I'd have had an older brother and he would have stood up for me and he wouldn't have let those kids pick on me and we would have gotten along great. You know, all roses and rainbows of what could be. And um, so I wanted that for my kids. I wanted them to get along. I wanted them to be together in the world for each other, not against each other. So, okay, I want to have several kids. I want them to get along. That's my vision. And a lot of people in the world especially, but even in Christian homes, are like, you know, kids are going to fight. They're just going to be that way. It's just how it is. You can't really expect them to get along. And I thought, why not? Are you serious? Why not? God says we're to love one another. In Hebrews, God says pursue peace. Pursue peace. He didn't say it drops in your lap. He didn't say it's easy. He said pursue it. And I thought, hey, I want it. We're going to pursue it. So I had my vision. It was strong because of my own personal need. And so I thought, you know what? We're going to pursue peace in our house. And we are going to love one another. (laughs) You're going to figure it out. (laughs) Here's what it looks like. Here's what the Bible says it is. Love is patient. We are going to be patient with each other. Love is kind. We are going to be kind to each other. This is what our house will be. And if our house was not that way, we instructed our children in the way it should be. Because of course they fought. Of course they had disagreements. So what do you do with that when you're in the kingdom? What do you do with disagreements? Well, let's learn. Let's figure it out. Let's pursue peace. So everyone has a vision. What is yours? Everyone has different levels of desire for their vision. Okay, we talked about baby Evelyn has a vision to be fed, to be warm, to be comforted, right? I had three kids. All three of them were very different in their visions as babies. Okay, Jessica was happy as long as she was held. That was her vision. I just want to be held. If you hold me, I'm good. Okay, she would wait for food. She'd hang out as long as she was there with me. We're good. Jonathan didn't even care. I was like, I put him on the floor. He'd be like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's interesting. He'd look around. When he could crawl, he'd explore. He didn't have a vision for being held. He didn't have a vision for needing all that stuff. Okay, then came Jordan. Jordan's vision was really strong for being held and for eating and for just being with mom all the time. Now, Jessica liked being held, but, you know, if I'd put her down for a nap, she'd cry for a little bit, and then she'd figure, okay, it's time to go to sleep, and she'd go to sleep after crying it out for a little bit. Jonathan was easy. He'd go to sleep pretty easy. Jordan would have none of it. 
that girl, I tried the whole cry it out thing that they said, you know, oh, just let them cry it out. They'll go, they'll go to sleep. I am not kidding. We tried it, I think, twice. That girl cried for hours. I was like, are you, really, people do this? Come on, there, there is no way people listen to a baby cry for this long. But I'm going to try it. That girl cried and cried. Have you all ever really cried? Do you know how much energy it takes to really cry? That baby spent a lot of energy crying for hours. How strong was her vision? What would you do to have your vision fulfilled? Would you cry out for hours, spending all that energy because your vision is that strong? Would you? Or are you content to get a little bit and, all right, that's good. How strong is your vision? If it's not very strong, but you know it's the right vision, what do you do? You feed it. You feed that vision. How do you feed it? <laughs> feed it with the word, right? What does it look like from God's perspective? What should I look like in fulfilling this vision? So I ignored all my friends who let their siblings, their kids fight. I ignored that. I said, mm -mm, we're not having that in this house. And thank goodness I had a very strong partner who also agreed with that. And so when I was really tired of dealing with it, he did. Guys, we spent hours, hours talking about where is your heart in this? Where is your heart towards your brother? Where is your heart towards your sister? Is it a heart of love? Is it wanting good things for them? And I'm teaching them to want good things for you because we're a family. We're a family, right? All of us. We're in the body of Christ and we're a family. We should want good things for each other. So we should treat each other like God would treat each other. That's part of a vision, right? God may give you a vision for coworkers. That person over there, what do they need from God? Can I be the filler of that need? Can I do that? Can I bring the kingdom to my workplace? Can I bring the kingdom to my school? Is that my vision? And feed it. And I'll tell you, uh, we spent over a year studying love. We were very blessed to have someone who discipled us in that and led us in that path. His name was G. Don Edwards. And uh, he's since gone to be with the Lord, but that changed our lives. When you think about the love of God and all the different parts of that, and you really study that, and then you start thinking, wait a minute, this isn't just for me. This is not just about me. And then it's not just about my little family. There is a world out there that it's about. And if you can figure out how much God loves you and all the different ways he loves you and be that love for someone who's never experienced it, it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance it's the goodness. That might be your vision. How can you do it? What kind of effort would you put in to that vision? So each of our kids grew up with that kind of mentality. Love. You're going to love each other. And then 
you're going to love your neighbors and you're going to love your teachers and you're going to love those around you. Now they each express it differently. Okay, we've got Jessica. She wants everybody to experience the power of God. He is so powerful. He can do all these amazing things. And she prays for people and they get healed. And she just expresses that power of God and reveals that to others. And she brings the kingdom in that way. And there's Jonathan. He's different. Okay? He brings the kingdom with unconditional love. He just takes everybody just how they are. And he walks beside them. He says, hey, come on. Let's hang out. I want to show you what love is. It's just walking together, no judgment, not asking anything from you. Here are my standards. I'm going to live by these standards. Come on. Let's hang out and just enjoy the presence of unconditional love. And then there's Jordan, different again. She expresses it with just the faithfulness, the steadfastness of God's love. She expresses, here's God's plan A. Let's do it. She's very organized and disciplined and all about the way things should be done. Now, if you're not doing it, that's okay. But let me show you God's plan A. I'd like for you to see what good things are there if you follow God's plan. She, hanged, she hangs out. She's at, uh, when she was at Richland, she hung out with people who were gay, Muslims, all of it. And, and she didn't judge them. She just hung out with them. And she inserted the wisdom of God into their lives. When they were having problems, they'd come to her. Because they knew who would have good advice. And she'd say, well, you know, wisdom would say, do this. And they're like, wow, you know a lot of stuff. That's, that's good advice. She's like, yeah, I got it from God. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things. So each of them brings out something different about the kingdom. And there's a place for each of them. We're all different. Different personalities, different economic backgrounds, different histories. Some of us have come out of great families. Some of us have come out of not so great families. But you all have something that the world needs. And when you figure out how God deals with you, you can pass that along to the world. Like he has loved us. You can be loved too. So what would you do to see your vision fulfilled is really the question. If it's not very strong, feed it. If it is strong, what are the steps you need to take? What are you willing to do? We lived with James's parents for a while so that I could stay at home with our kids. Wasn't convenient, wasn't exactly fun. I sure would have liked to have my own place to do what I wanted with. But it was a commitment that we made that our kids would have one of us speaking into their lives as they were growing up. Then they went to school and they moved the hearts of some teachers and they asked if they could pray for them. We had one visit this church because, was it you, Jessica? Because Jessica said, can I pray for you? And he was like, whoa. Whoa. Where did that come from? Well, it came from time and effort spent on my vision of my family. So what are you focusing on? Just think about that for a minute. Where are your thoughts? 
if they're on things that you think, maybe I shouldn't spend quite so much time there, you can shift your thinking. It's never too late to change that. You're here. You're alive. Right? So how do you figure out what to focus on? Well, the Great Commission says go and make disciples. Ask God, is there someone I'm supposed to be discipling? Is there someone that needs what I have in my life already? And it doesn't have to be some big production of you need to come to my church so you can get saved and you can find the love of God. No, you can bring it to them. You can show them right there, right where you are. Because they already know something is different about you, hopefully. Hopefully that spirit that's in you overflows a little bit and they see that person's got something different. It's interesting. wonder what that's about. When I got saved, I was actually in college. I, I call it, you know, my, uh, being, my being born again experience. I had grown up Catholic. I always believed in God, believed in Jesus. I was probably going to heaven, you know. I, I believed in all of that. But to me, God was up there somewhere. And if I had some sort of a crisis, maybe, maybe he would do something to help me out. Maybe. You had to work really hard for it, though, and do all the right things. I didn't know what those right things were. But that was my thought. And I was in college, and friends started walking beside me and said, how's it going? I'm like, oh, I'm really kind of stressed out. I just have a lot going on. Nothing bad was happening. I had a good life. My parents were paying for college. I had a car out there. I was getting A's and B's, not even working hard at it, you know. Life was good, but I was really busy and kind of stressed out, and a little tired and run down. I told him that, and he was like, can I pray for you? I'm like, sure. Now, to, a, to me, that meant go back to his dorm room, get on his knees, you know, hands on the bed, folded just right, and he was going to pray for me. Oh, no. <laughs> he stopped in the middle of the sidewalk, everybody around, and prayed for me out loud in front of everyone. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. I didn't hear a word of that prayer. Not one word. I know he prayed for peace because that's what I told him I needed, but I didn't hear a word. The next day, I had the most overwhelming peace. I had never in my life felt that before. I was like, wait a minute. Hang on. You mean that the God of the universe that, that's up there, you know, just watching us and everything, like, he cares that I'm stressed out? That did not compute in my world. God was only for the big things. If you had an emergency, he might show up. But I'm stressed out and he cares? Are you serious? Come on. No. It's just me. My life is fine. I was done for then. A God that cared about me like that? Are you kidding? Who wouldn't want that? All he did was pray that I wouldn't be so stressed out. Can you pray for somebody that they're not so stressed out? It's not a big deal, right? But it changed my life. It completely turned me around from a God that was just up there hanging out watching me to a God who cared about every part of my life that I'm a little stressed out. Wow. You can be that person for someone near you. You don't have to bring rain after three years of drought. You don't have to do a big thing. It's God who shows up. Your job is just to open your mouth and say a little prayer. And let them know you're praying for them. That's it. It's not hard. And God will meet you right where you take that step of action. Start out with something small. 
Okay. At Bethel, they uh, teach the kids to go out and do kind of like treasure hunts like we've done here. And they say, you know, just go out and ask if you can pray for people. And they have somebody come alongside who's more experienced and been doing it. And they walk alongside and they do it together. And God is like that. He'll, he'll meet you step by step. Just go out and say a simple prayer. Do a simple thing. Make one change in your family. Make one change in how you deal with a colleague at work. Get that vision of what God can do with you. And little things, he can take those little things and make them big things. That's him. Him and the Holy Spirit. All you have to do is take that little step. I, uh, that guy that prayed for me, I lost touch with him. I sent him a Facebook message a few years ago. Never heard a reply from it, but uh, I just wanted to let him know that his one little prayer on the sidewalk that day created the Dunham household in a manner of speaking. Because if I hadn't had that shift of thinking and I hadn't thought God cares about every part of my life, I wouldn't have had my thinking changed. I wouldn't have given over my will to his will. I would have gone on doing my thing. My thing was fine, you know. I was gonna graduate, maybe go to graduate school, become a counselor of some sort. My degree was in psychology, wanted to do something with kids. And then I met James and things changed. My priorities changed because I was sold out for whatever he wanted to do with my life. And he did some pretty awesome things. And I'm very blessed with the things that he's done. It wasn't my plan, but it started with a prayer on a sidewalk that shifted my entire life. And now, now that my kids are grown, he's giving me new visions. Every year he gives me a couple of students that are really on my heart, that I speak into their lives and I show them the love of Jesus and I do what I can to show them that God is there he loves them. Even at the nice school I go to, I've, got, I've had kids with uh, parents in and out of jail, moms addicted to pain medicine, older siblings in the alternative education center. It's, it's there, even in that nice school. And those kids need somebody to show them that God is there. He loves them. And so that's my new vision. And I keep up with a couple of those kids that I haven't had for a while and check on them, see how they're doing and show them I care. I still care. Even though you're not in my classroom anymore, I still ask about you because you are worth it. That's my vision. And I put effort into those kids. So what's your vision and how strong is it? That's the question, isn't it? <sighs> Lord, I ask that you just reveal to each person here how amazing they are in your kingdom. Every person here has something for you to offer the world. Every person can have a vision of your kingdom because they're worth it and you're worth it. Lord, I ask that you give them a hunger to see that vision fulfilled, that they would cry for hours and hours and hours, that their vision would be that strong.